everybody. I'm Devin O'Day, and welcome to Devin's Table. And for Devin's Table, I'm going to go to Sylvia's Table. Sylvia Gagner is here from Green Door Gourmet, where we are in the Green Door Gourmet Kitchen. And this show is not just about cooking, is it? No, it's about everything you can imagine to make your home a little bit better. Tips, tricks, all kinds of fun things to learn about. You know, I, were you ever in Future Homemakers of America with Home Ec? No, I grew up on a farm and we lived it. <laughs> you lived it. Well, I was president of my F, of my future Homemakers of America. And my, I loved Home Ec. My mother said, you have to take Home Ec. They don't really teach it like they used to. So th there are going to be some of those tips that we're going to bring to this show just to get you back around the table to get nourished. And we have a very cool sponsor. So we're going to talk a little bit about wine on this show. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about wine. Okay, I like that. <laughs> Amber Falls Winery is in Hampshire, Tennessee, and they have a lovely tasting room in Opry Mills Mall. We're going to find out more about them and some of the wines they have to offer. Welcome to Devin's Table. We'll be right back. Amber Falls, I can hear you calling me. I can while away my time sipping on your wine. Out among your trees so tall that Amber Falls. One of the nice things that we've done and one of the, one of the reasons we built the way we did is that we have a very attractive and I think unique tasting room where people actually come down into a real wine cellar to taste our wines. Our outside venues are very, very attractive and popular where we have music on a regular basis throughout the summer. We have our uh, Music on the Ridge series, uh, which on Fridays and Saturday nights. We occasionally have music on Sundays. As the winter months come along, we have uh, special events. We'll have uh, a, a big Snow Village Christmas display down here. So we do things year round. Uh, and of course, I guess the biggest thing we do is our Cajun Fest, which we have on the Saturday Memorial Day weekend, where we'll do several thousand pounds of crawfish, we'll have jambalaya, etouffee, uh, fried uh, alligator, uh, uh, live bands, that we, Cajun bands that we bring up from Louisiana. So it is quite an event. And that's probably the highlight of what we do during the year. In Tennessee, the wine business is really growing at quite, uh, quite rapidly and uh, we're part of a wine trail here and but it makes it really a beautiful setting to be able to drive down the trace, very relaxed and see the beautiful scenery and be able to leave the trace every now and then, go to a winery and get back on it and um, just watching people enjoy themselves at a venue that we can provide is, is really very rewarding. We love the Four Seasons, we love the people, and we just love this area. We love the beautiful hills of Middle Tennessee. Our next story is contributed by Katie Martin and Chris Hicks of the UT Extension Service in Smith County. In Pickett County, they discovered a wonderful lavender farm. We'll find all about it in their episode from Cultivating Communities. Hi, I'm Sue Lado. We're at K&S Farm in Birdstown, Tennessee. We are a lavender farm. Um, we also are beekeepers. We have our own apiary um, and we have a, a multitude of farm animals that we also have on the farm for your enjoyment. Um, I've always been intrigued by lavender. I was a combat casualty nurse the last 13 years of my nursing career and I was always looking for holistic things to uh, help with 
some of the PTSD, anxiety, hypervigilance that some of my guys were, were having and um, lavender just kept kind of popping up. So uh, it intrigued me enough to start growing it and to start making some products. And they were kind of my guinea pigs, if you will. Um, let them try some of the products that I made. I made a lavender therapy dough and some eye pillows, just common things that you, know, that you can find on the market. Um, and evidence-based, it was awesome. We had just awesome, awesome results with it. So I told my husband when I retired um, in 2018 that I wanted to go ahead and grow lavender and that's kind of how we got started. We, um, we do tours. This came about, unfortunately, with COVID. I guess it was a, a blessing in disguise. Um, I started growing the lavender just as a, a craft, if you will, something to kind of keep me busy and occupied. Um, and then when COVID hit, it just seemed like everybody was indoors and people couldn't get out. So we thought, you know what, why don't we open the farm to the public and let people walk through? You know, they didn't have to wear a mask. They could be outside. They can enjoy this. And and um, one thing led to another. And I tell you, it's just been, it's been a blessing ever since. We've just been really blessed with all the folks that have come through from all over the country, actually. They come to uh, Dale Hollow Lake and they vacation and they find their way up here to our little slice of heaven. Um, we're part of the United States Lavender Growers Association. So I did about two years worth of research before we put our first plant in the ground. Billy was a blessing. I think the first time I called him and told him what I wanted, he said, lavender, hmm. <laughs> I'm not really sure about that. Um, but he put us in touch with Mr. Rob Holland and Mr. Holland came up with Billy and we sat on our porch here and gave him our business plan and what we wanted to do. And um, he's been nothing but a support for us ever since. We have very clay soil up here, and so we really had to amend what the boxes were put, what the plants were put in. And we put them in boxes for several reasons. Once again, because we could amend the soil. So they're actually in a, a mix, a potting mix with some bone meal and some limestone. Um, it's easier for us to keep you know, keep everything kind of at bay. We have 80 plants in the ground um, and we've decided at first we were gonna do 100 more. <laughs> uh, after this year's harvest, we decided that I think we're gonna stay with the 80. Um, it's just my husband and I, and, and it's quite a challenge when it all comes into bloom. So we have uh, five different varieties that we grow and uh, the majority of our variety is what you call an intermediate, it's called phenomenal. And when that all comes into bloom, this big one right here, when this comes into bloom, I can get about 40, 45 bunches off of this plant right here. So when you're harvesting and hanging and, and you know, having to make wreaths and wands and everything else, it can be uh, quite kind of time consuming. Well, we start you off um, by actually having you come over and touch the lavender. We have you smell it and people don't realize they're like, oh, yeah, it's kind of all right, but then we have you actually run your hands through it and actually get the fragrance from the lavender. And people bring their hands to their face and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, they just love that. Um, because the whole plant is usable. Um, so we kind of tell them what we, what we do with it, you know, as far as soaps and, and things like that. We walk them through our grapes. We have three different types of muscadine grapes. Um, our little bed over there is what we call our pollinator bed. We are beekeepers as well. Um, we do put up our own honey. So we talk to, especially the youngsters about pollination and how important pollinators are. Um, and it's amazing because people think, oh, bees are pollinators, but they don't realize that hummingbirds and butterflies and bats, um, they are all they are all pollinators. So it's amazing how many how many times people are like, wow, I didn't really know that. So, um, and then of course we just walk them around here. This is what we call our walk by faith garden. Once again, it's just kind of a wildflower mix, and um, as you can see, we get lots of butterflies and bees um, and our hummingbirds, and so. Uh, we walk them around the back. We have on this side over here, we have all of our uh, culinary lavender, which is lavender that you can actually cook with. Um, you can cook with the intermedia, but the angustifolia is really what you want um, as far as your flavor, robust flavor. Um, so they, everyone gets to feel that and touch that and smell that too. 
We walk them around to the back. Um, we grow our own loofah. You'd be amazed how many people don't realize that loofah is actually grown. Um, so it's in the cucumber family. We uh, infuse it into our soaps. We sell it in our shop. So uh, yeah, people are really amazed at how, you know, they, they think it comes from the ocean. Um, and then of course, on the other side, we have our goats, we have our chickens, our horses. Um, Winston, our pot billy pig is out here wandering around. We have our own little shop, a farm shop, and we tell people that pretty much everything that's in the shop is harvested, grown, harvested, and produced by something on the farm. Um, we do go down into town occasionally, and we'll do the local farmer's market down in town. Um, honestly, since I'm the only one making the product, it's amazing uh, just to keep our store stocked. When we have uh, five or six families come in at a time, they can wipe our little store out. So um, we've, we've decided that we're just gonna stay, you know, fairly, fairly home-based, if you will really encourage people to make an appointment to come on up and then that way we can spend the hour and 15 minutes kind of walking them around giving them that that really good interactive tour so yeah while K&S Farms is about eight acres, they certainly make use of every single inch. After learning a little bit about the lavender, it was time to meet the livestock. Everything from chickens, goats, a pot-bellied pig named Winston, and of course my personal favorite, the Clydesdales housed on the farm. We started the Clydesdales, gosh, about 20 years ago. Um, my husband was active duty military and when he retired up in Connecticut, um, that was our last duty station, we, uh, I've always ridden all my life and um, he wanted a, a bigger horse. He kind of felt like he needed the, the bigger horse to ride. So kind of got us intrigued with the, the Clydesdale breed. And um, we had friends who had a livery business, a very thriving livery business, and they started subcontracting us on the weekends. Um, one thing led to the next. We were doing shows, we were doing weddings and quinceaneras and anniversaries and all different kinds of things. So um, that's how we got into the horses and we've been into the Clydesdales now for 20, 25 years. So when we moved down from Connecticut seven years ago, they came down with us. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny because I tell people we both worked really high stress jobs. You know, he was he was nuclear submarines, you know, and uh, my like I said, my last 13 years I was a combat casualty nurse, and um, so when I was getting ready to retire, a lot of my guys were like, "So what are you gonna do?" I said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna grow lavender." And they're like, "What?" I'm gonna do <laughs> big the big burly marines. You're what? And I'm like, "I'm gonna grow lavender." I said, "I'm gonna just do a change of pace," and um, you know, I mean, I couldn't ask for any more than what we have. You can find out more about KNS Lavender by going to their Facebook page. They're located in Birdstown, Tennessee, close to Dale Hollow Lake in Pickett County, the smallest county in Tennessee. And they've got a great story and great things to do all year round. And you can follow the great shows from Cultivating Communities, the UT Extension Service in Smith County with our friends, Katie Martin and Chris Hicks. Thank you so much for contributing, guys, and thanks for all you do to help us get back to the goodness of the earth. You know, I thought I was a freak for collecting cookbooks. I thought I had the biggest collection in the world until I met Sylvia. I got okay. you beat. How many cookbooks do you have, you think? I probably have, if you count the community cookbooks and the fun things like this, about 6,000. 6,000? <laughs> it's a problem. Well, we, we all do, and, and we can look up, people go, oh, why do you need cookbooks? Why do you need cookbooks? Because you can just look it up on the internet. It's not the same. No, it's not. There's something about holding the book, mm -hmm. and there was a great series called The Dirty Pages. Did you ever hear about that? No. What was because it? the best cookbooks, when you open them up, they have splotches and spots and stains, and that's where you know a home cook has used that recipe over and over and over again, and it's the best recipe. I love that. When I did My Southern Food, which was my cookbook, it's on Amazon, you can find it, but they said, where do you get your recipes? And I said, the binder. We saved all of our family recipes, but my little grandma, in her little handwriting, her little arthritic hands would write these recipes, and they were all splattered with gravy, so we scanned some of those recipes into the book, and it's one of my treasures, because a lot of people would never know her, but now they know her through food, and that's the way the Southern cook is.
you know, there's always, if you go to one of those southern meals and, and everybody brings a potluck dish or whatever, everybody's known by their dish. And then they all say, can I have the recipe? And the lady says, oh, sure. But she always leaves out one thing. So it's <laughs> never as good as when she made it. Well, speaking of favorite recipes, let's talk about some of these books that you have. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know, I love cookbooks, which we just went mm -hmm. through how much I love cookbooks. But whether it's from a research standpoint, you know, over here, we've mm -hmm. put out some of my favorite Cajun ones. They're like everything you can imagine for that, including how to make king cakes. Um, I have American Cake, which is probably my favorite mm. cake cookbook because it tells you from the very first cake made in the United States all the way through to more modern cakes and how to do them and do them well. But when I just need to feel a little nostalgic, I, I'm picking up a community cookbook. Oh, and I, love it. Those, I like the First Baptist Church cookbook. First the, Presbyterian. I knew, I knew you'd have a church lady cookbook. And then this one, how about that one for you there? Isn't that oh, fun? Oh, and Foster Caldwell's Book of Southern and Creole Home Cooking. And that's got a lot of splatters in it, I'll tell uh, you. It's, it's the stuff. Mine, the Cane River cookbook from the Junior League down in Natchitoches, Louisiana, and uh, River Road, which is the Monroe. Mm -hmm. Oh, the River Road has the... Oh my gosh! I've won two or three cooking contests by using recipes out of that book. It is it is a stalwart in the kitchen. You can't go wrong with recipes out of that. That thing and and this stuff, this is just an idea of how to keep a book together. Mine have, mine's falling apart. I've got a big rubber band now that holds it. Together. Well, I've got one of those right here to oh, show yeah. you. Yeah, this is a this was my grandmother's oh, wow. cookbook, and she used this little Gaston County cookbook for making everything you can possibly imagine. But mostly a lot of cakes and cookies. You see the little spots there. Mm -hmm. So this was a, this, a fun memory to pull this one out today. I also went through and I wrote out family recipes. And I cannot oh. encourage anyone who is watching this more to do that. Because you think, well, I can always watch them make it again. You never know when you're not going to be able to watch that person make something again. So write mm -hmm. down those family recipes and make a fun little book. It's a great Christmas gift. You can put it together. You can get it fancy. You can take pictures mm -hmm. of everybody and make it as uh, outgoing or as simple as you want. But it's a great thing to do. I love it. I saw a great wedding gift that a mother of the groom made for her new daughter-in-law. She took the, her son's favorite recipes she wrote them on cards and had them laminated, decorated them, and put them on a loop that she could just hang on the counter, hang on the, a hook in the cab, in the kitchen. And these laminated recipes, all of her son's favorites, <laughs> she get, I love that, it. Isn't that great? She said, here's my, my gift to you. Is all, this is what he likes. And it's never really something fancy. It's always like the way mom made mac and cheese, mm -hmm. the way mama makes lasagna, the way mama does her favorite spaghetti. And so it's a great gift for a new bride or for a granddaughter. Yes. But this one um, kind of caught my eye because this was, in my thought process, what you were talking about and wanting to bring people back around the table again. Yes, yes, yes. The name of this book is A Mess of Greens and Other Joys of Living. Mm -hmm. this, is all about, this is all about food, but it's also about choosing how you lead your life and sometimes life is messy it's a big old mess of greens but it can be delicious at the very end of it and i'm glad you said a mess of greens because we get caught up in if we don't cook fancy we're not really a cook so it's not really a meal so it's not really it's not just as simple as you can get sometimes makes the best meal something simple that you get around the table and fresh something fresh that's why when you go into Green Door Gourmet and you smell all those smells, you go, oh, before it gets put in a can, <laughs> before it gets put in a freezer, this is what it smells like. And it makes you want to get in and prepare it. And it's real. And most really great recipes, if you start with great fresh ingredients, you only need five, six, seven things in the whole recipe to have an amazing meal. Mm -hmm. You don't have to cover up the flavor of the food by making some fancy sauce. Isn't that the truth? We're going to talk about some of the cool items that are available during the fall because we don't always think about we always know when peaches are in season and when strawberries are in season but when we go into the fall there are some things that are definitely fall vegetables let's talk about some of those that are popular during the the, the autumn months ah oh, greens 
Mm -hmm. You have your winter squash. You have your summer squash that transitions into winter squash. You have your storage crops, as we call them on the mm -hmm. farm. You're going to get your peanuts, your sweet potatoes, your regular potatoes. You make your larder. Have you heard that word in a long time? I have not. That A larder, which is your pantry, mm -hmm. that's going to get you all the way through the winter. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about and demystify how to handle some of them that people are terrified of. Yeah, how not to cut your hand open when you're trying one of the, because winter squash are hard. There's a way to do this and do it safely, <laughs> and we're going to talk about that. Yes, there is a couple of tricks that I can't wait to show you. And we can't wait to talk about wine. Amber Falls Winery has some delicious wine. Coming up, we're going to talk about how to actually open a bottle of wine. A lot of times people, we get so crazy, they're, they're, if you go to try to get a bottle opener, if you've not opened a lot of bottles of wine or you're stuck without a bottle opener, we have all sorts of tips to help you with. We'll be right back with Devin's Table. Let me turn you on to a place where I find my great cookbooks. Go to McKay's. It's over on the west side of town. It's on the... Old Hickory exit off I-40. They have a great cooking aisle filled to brimming with books and including general kind of cookbooks or you've even got the club collections like the Cotton Country, one of my favorites, and it was a steal at three bucks. I mean, come on. Plus, they've got genre cooking, different ethnic versions of cooking. Any kind of cooking that you want to learn, they have probably got a great book for a great price to both instruct you or give you a wonderful recipe. Maybe it's an old time favorite you're trying to find or replace that might have belonged in grandma's kitchen. Or maybe it's a brand new one that you just are looking for a great bargain on. McKay's will take buy, trade, sell, and they give you store credit that you can use. Even if you want healthy cooking, they've got that too. If you want to find great deals on books, food preserving, and all sorts of things for cooking and instruction, well, they've got it. McKay's is located off I-40 on the west side of town, the Old Hickory Exit. Take a right, and then take another right, and you're there. Chili is steaming in the pot, homemade chicken salad and coffee, super hot. Fresh roasted veggies and succotash too. Grab a scoop of tuna salad if you're passing through. Tabbouleh and noodles and tomato bisque galore. Fill up your plate and come back for some more. Yum, yum. Um, I have my husband here, JK Brister, to help me out with the tasting portion of our honey test to see um, if we're what the difference between fake honey and real honey is. Because right. did you know that fake honey, um, the taste is going to linger in your mouth for a long time? I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Real honey is going to go away in a matter of minutes. So we are going to get a look here at two different types of honey and we're going to do it together that way I have um, some backup here. So I'm going to give you the real honey first. Okay. Here we go. Because the real honey will go away quickly and we're going to try one of our thicker honeys. I'm going to give you a little bit that way. I'm like Pooh Bear here. Pooh Bear. <laughs> this is crystallized too. Mm. So pretty. Real honey. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. oh, that's amazing. Mm. Still there. Tick tock. Tick right. Tock. Okay. Still there. Kind of. It's kind of starting to fade now. Feel it on the back of my tongue. The back of my throat now. Mmm. On my lips. <laughs> now it's gone. Now it's pretty gone. It is? Except for the back of my, like in the back of my throat, I can yeah, still taste still it a little. It. But it's gone out of my mouth. <laughs> That's it. About <laughs> okay. a minute, minute and a half. I don't know if it's been quite that long. No, but I'm saying it's still there a little bit, but I can tell it's going away. Okay, so let's try some fake honey and see how long it hangs with us. Oh, Lord. Mm. 
Okay. I haven't had fake honey in so long. I don't. I don't know. Try this one. Well, yeah, okay. That one, I don't know if we've determined that one's 100 percent fake. I think this one is pretty fake. Yeah. See, but look how fast that pours. Oh, I wouldn't need all that. Put a little bit more in there. It's a fast pouring. Hmm. It doesn't even taste the same. Like it doesn't even taste. It doesn't. Even, it's sugary. It's so sugary. The tip of my tongue is on fire. I mean, it's all tingly. <laughs> yeah, it's got a little. Oh, it's hanging. That's all over my yeah, mouth. Yeah, and it's uh, it's got a Cairo syrup. It tastes like Cairo syrup. I feel that all over. Not like the real honey. The real honey like was traveled through my mouth and down my throat. This is like. Yeah, this is hanging uh, on. Everywhere. strong and it's very rich yeah uh it's definitely not it doesn't not even close to that other honey. that's like it's like coating my throat and not going away and that and it has like a sugary uh, a, do you want it to tastes it? no it tastes like sugar yeah. Yeah, uh, it does honey like does sugar. not taste like sugar you know what it actually tastes like is uh when we're outfits. starting the hives and we're feeding sugar to them to get the hive strong, oh, yeah. it's it it may be sugar real water. honey, but it's actual sugar honey. And a lot of beekeepers hate feeding their bees. They will not uh, use the honey that's made with sugar. They'll allow the bees to eat right. all of that honey and use it for the brood and for the hive to get it stronger. And then they'll stop feeding them sugar through the growing season of the flowers and the, the clove, clover and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so what Still happens there. is, is the, honey, the honey taste changes. That if that is real honey, it's, it's real honey. sugar honey. Still meaning, the meaning that they- Mouth to my cheeks. I know, but that, what I'm saying is it could be real honey, it's but it's all- honey. If it's made on a big bee farm, they're determined. feeding sugar. It's still in our mouth. You still taste I know. It? It's that sugar. The honey wasn't still there. It's sugar honey. But it's probably K-Row syrup. Yeah, it's in my hey, cheeks, let me taste. in my dimples, behind my dimples. Let me do this. Since we got all this chemistry, it's beautiful and everything. I'm going to do that. After, it, after eating real honey... I can't ever eat this again. This is terrible. <laughs> it's not even close to either one of those, but the consistency of this is like this. So there you go. Taste your honey. That's the most funnest way. That's right. To see if your honey. And is then or not. when you're done tasting the honey, you just get a good little honey kiss, <laughs> like that. <laughs>
and grapes grew in the state of Tennessee. Yes, we are hitting the map these days. There are a lot of places people only think of California, maybe Washington mm -hmm. State, but Tennessee is holding their own these days. Uh, Tennessee wines are incredible. And if you want to go to Hampshire, Tennessee, you can actually stay there. They've got an Airbnb that you can stay right there in the winery. Because mm -hmm. people go out to California for a winery tour. Well, guess what? You can stay right here in Tennessee and do a winery tour as well. We're going to do a winery tour now because they, we were talking about Cajun recipes and my favorite Cajun cookbooks, your favorite Cajun cookbooks. We've got a Cajun wine, a Cajun wine from Hampshire, Tennessee, from Amber Falls Winery. A Cajun-inspired wine, which is great. This is going to be a little bit on the sweeter side. Mm -hmm. So when you have some of that spicy food, you know, the, mm -hmm. that Cajun and Creole is known for, right? right. Mm -hmm. This kind of balances out a little bit of that heat because the wine is a little bit sweeter. So it's mm -hmm. good pairing to go along with that. Or if you have people like my mama who tried wine and she didn't really like it very much so she put a little sweet and low in it. <laughs> oh no, this is I not know. that kind of wine. Though. I know, I know that's, you don't need any sweet and low in this. It's awesome if that, if you like a sweeter wine, my mama said it always, serve it over ice cubes and put a little sweet and low in it and it's just perfect. Yes, well you know a sweet red wine served over ice this time of year slightly chilled or served with a little bit of ice mm -hmm. is not a bad thing because we still are going to have some warm days that pop up all the way through December uh, in Tennessee and so you need something that is a little bit more refreshing. Mm -hmm. Chilling the wine, normally red wine is served at room temperature. Mm -hmm. um, 62 to 65 degrees is the perfect ambient temperature to serve red wine. Mm -hmm. But if you want a little cooler, just put it in the fridge for 15 minutes before mm -hmm. you're going to serve it. Take the temperature down and it's very refreshing that way. I'm so glad that you brought that up because we have this idea that we don't drink wine because we don't know all the rules. There are so many rules. First of all, here's the only rule. Do you like it? Do you like it a certain way? Then that's how you drink it. You gave me another rule too about cooking with wine. Never cook with a wine that you wouldn't want to drink. Why would you put bad wine in a great recipe? Also, if you're cooking with the same wine that's going in the recipe, it will build that flavor profile in the food as well. One of the things that we're going to share with you on upcoming episodes is ways to use wine in your cooking and your baking. It's now nothing wrong with just pouring it in a glass and drinking it, but there's a lot more uses in your kitchen. And so we're going to take Amber Falls Winery into your kitchen and show you some cooking. But right now, we're just going to show you how to open the bottle. It will make you crazy if you find all of these openers. But let's just find just something really simple that people can get and that's not terribly expensive as far as an opener. So you can get whatever kind of opener you would like. But for me, the standard waiter's tool is the way to open a bottle of wine. You stand less of a chance of breaking the cork you also have a more leverage to get the cork out easier. Uh, it comes with the handy foil cutter right built into the tool so you don't have to have a separate foil cutter um, or anything like that. So I love a good waiter's tool. And I really like the ones that have a second flange, a double flange. So when you put it on the wine, it can help you um, move the wine cork up without putting as much pressure on it. So I really like these. You can get them for five bucks. I like that. I like the five buck part. Well, let's just show waiter's tool. How do you do it? It's got a little knife in it. Yes. So you want to take this. This is your foil cutter and it's a pretty sharp blade. And I think that uh, you got to remember that it's a pretty sharp blade. I like the ones that have a little bit of serration right here. So it's got a little texture to it. It helps grab the foil. Mm -hmm. And when you go to open the wine, if you're presenting a bottle of wine at the table to someone, of course you would want to hold the label so they could see what wine uh, you were opening for them. But if you're just opening a bottle of wine at home, that's not as important. Um, we're not going to talk about fine waiter service. We're going to talk about <laughs> I'm ready to open this wine and that's get right. going, right? <laughs> okay, right. so what you want to do is you want to take the um, foil cutter, the little mini knife if you will, and you want to cut going around the foil. You see how I'm cutting going around the yeah, foil Yeah, and here? around the little lip of the around bottle. The lip. Not at the top where the cork is, but... You know, some people try to do it right here, but truly, this is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Sign of a professional is you don't have to take the whole thing off. Hopefully, you've cut well enough. 
and then you just take your knife right in there and looky there and you're just able to take this off. Okay, right so off. you got the foil off. You got the foil off and you got a nice oh, clean that's good. lip. And the reason that they started putting foil or sometimes you see wax dipped on the top, mm -hmm. um, it was to protect the cork so nothing would get into the bottle. It was used as an additional sealant. That's why you see that foil over the top. And can we talk a little bit too why people uh, store their wine like so, like horizontally as opposed to vertically? So corks have to stay wet or they will dry out. And when they dry out, like anything else, and when it gets drier, it gets smaller, air can get into the wine and oxidize the wine. So you want to make sure that the cork is staying in contact. And so you'll see people that store completely level like this. You'll see some people that disgorge it down a little bit even mm -hmm. more. Um, but that's why you want to do that. Is if, that key help it not crumble? Dry out. Dry out. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're all different kinds of corks. There are modern corks that um, are a resin-based cork and not really a tree cork anymore. Mm -hmm. You also find um, Stelvin enclosures. Have you ever seen that before? I don't even know what that is. It's no. a screw cap. <laughs> It sounds really nice to say Stelvin enclosure, okay, though, right? You know, I'm very familiar with. So and there you go. With the tap. I'm yeah, you know, with that all too. those things work as yeah. well. But um, so we're going to go for the cork now. So remember to close the knife. Rookie rule: if you forget to close the knife, you think I'll just leave it open. Invariably, your hand will slip, and then you'll have a cut. You don't want to do that. So close that up, and then you're going to open the actual corkscrew mm -hmm. part of the waiter's tool. Mm -hmm. Your waiter's tool. Just go for the middle of the bottle of wine here and put the, the pork screw in like that and get it started. Mm -hmm. And then after you do that, you screw it up. See, this is mm -hmm. rocket science, isn't it? But you know, I have watched many a cork go bad in this particular part. Don't try to go so fast. Yeah. yeah, just put it in and you don't have to go all the way down because with the double flange, look, you've got yes. a second lever right there. That's perfect. All right, and then you just pull up, and then when you get about halfway out, then you can go to the second one. Oh, that's See, great. that nice leverage, and you're not putting any pressure on the cork at all. And voila, there you go. And my, one of my favorite things is, is this. You can see that this bucket is marked from the CSA, but you're gonna get those rose geranium. Mm -hmm. That is a very old time flower that just, um, that smells so beautiful. The leaves are amazing. Mm. Love them. Rose geranium. Take a look at this. For centerpieces, Green Door Gourmet has you covered. All sorts of wonderful things. What will be uh, the, the things that are in season for flowers in the fall? Everything you're seeing right here. We still have the Lysianthus. Um, we have Celosia, which is a, another old time flower. This is more of a plume style Celosia, but we also have this guy. Maybe, maybe your granny grew this, it's called coxcomb, but it's yes. also a type of Celosia. Um, we've got um, some uh, little love in the mist, some dahlias. Th this mm -hmm. is a great time for dahlias. Marigolds, um, my, my granny always called this Royal Hawaiian. I'm sure that is not the proper name for it, but uh, the eucalyptus we talked about. Mm -hmm. These are chai flowers. Chai flowers. So oh literally, goodness. you can you can eat the leaves or you can uh, pick the blossoms. So it's great. This is gumfrina, sunflowers of all different colors. How long will we have sunflowers? Uh, sunflowers follow the pattern of the sun. So as mm -hmm. the days get shorter, mm -hmm. the sunflowers will bloom out. These are special sunflowers with all the different colors and they mm -hmm. really are designed for fall. So I'd say we've got maybe till the 1st of October for sunflowers. Then after that, they'll, they'll be no more. And tell me one more time about the CSA boxes for flowers. So it's a CSA um, for a bunch of flowers. You get a beautiful hand-tied bunch of flowers, one a week for how many weeks of the month. And you mm -hmm. can sign up at greendoorroommate.com.
garlicky jalapeno bites are just one of the many prepackaged mixes that you find for pastries and breads and yummies at Green Door Gourmet. You'll surprise everyone with how well you cook. Thank you for joining us for Devin's Table. In upcoming episodes, we'll talk about table decor, things about the home. We're going to make fall really special. Thank you, Sylvia Ganyer from Green Door Gourmet, which is located on River Road in Nashville. I go, it's a Walmart exit on west of town. If you go to Charlotte and then stay on River Road past Ray's Place, you'll see our sign. That's right. Right there. Don't go in the farm truck entrance. You go in the, and it's a, there's a nice welcome. I, uh, I, I love it. I feel like I'm home when I come here. It's just so amazing. And a big thank you to Amber Falls Winery. You have been a wealth of information, as I knew you would be. You're so good at what you do. Thank you for bringing all your knowledge to everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to share some of the things that I've learned along the way. And anytime I get to spend time with you, Devin, it's always oh, fun. I love it. I love it. The main part of this show is to get around the table again, get people you love, and nourish yourselves. Nourish yourselves with good food, good conversation, and good hearts. And I just want to say the best way to find a blessing is to first be one. Thanks for joining us at our table. Bye. Cheers.